It is good to see everybody. Welcome to the Hub tonight. If you would, go ahead and stand with us. So before we get started tonight, we're going to read. Uh, it's a passage that we've read a good bit. I just like doing it as an encouragement to us during this time of worship. Um, this is from Colossians 3, and it's verse 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you rich, richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So let's pray. Lord, we want to give thanks to you that we're able to come here, that we're able to sing these songs to you. I pray that anything that we do, whether it's school or work or, or sports, play, whatever it is, that we will do it for your glory, um, that you will be our motivation in the way that we do those things, Lord. So we just want to lift our songs up to you um, as praises to you. We give you the glory and the honor. Amen. <laughs>
of the blood of Jesus, we can go from death to life and have a relationship with you. That you loved us enough to do that that you didn't have to do, but that you chose to, Lord. We thank you for that, and we give you the glory.
Sing that chorus together. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of Kings. Praise forever. Praise forever to the King of kings. Lord, that is our praise to you. Praise and glory forever to the King of kings, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We give you the glory and our praise and the honor. All you are worthy. Amen. Appreciate it very much. Appreciate the band. It's a great song. Uh, I suspect we may sing that one in heaven. It's possible. It it has got the gospel all in it. So it's a great, great song. If you haven't got uh, a snack, go and get one and uh, get something to drink and take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be in the second part of Hebrews chapter 12. We have tonight and uh, next Wednesday is our last official pub services for we break before the summer. The following Wednesday after that, that is two weeks from tonight, we have a kickoff celebration in the gym. So if you'll help me by signing up, that's for you and your parents, your immediate family to come to that and we'll serve uh, sub sandwiches, um, chips and some cookies or fruit to go with it and we'll play a variety of games. And some of you say, I'm just not into games and that's cool. You just might want to just fellowship, just talk, hang out. So we'll do that from 6 to 8 o'clock that night, all right, from 6 to 8. So we'll have it all ready. Just want you to come and have a good time, and we'll celebrate by finishing school that week. That'll be the end of school officially that week, and then uh, we just kick off summertime. It's already summertime outside, right? I mean, like, the 90s is, is upon us, I think, Friday, 95. That, I, I like hot weather. Is anybody with me? Mr. Greg, thank y'all. I see that. One, I get to swim. All right? You, that helps. All right? And, uh, and I'm a little more used to it because in Texas, now it's hot here, but in Texas, man, it'd get over 100, sometimes 30 days in a row. All right? So 100, 105, 106. Uh, so this has got a little more humidity in, in South Carolina, but uh, I like air conditioning too, don't get me wrong, right? All right, but I like summertime, all right? 
Uh, so do sign up for the kickoff. A couple things. One, this Sunday is our graduation recognition service. Okay, we got some seniors in here tonight. Some have already graduated. Hallelujah. Uh, but to remind you, we, we'll have Sunday school like normal at 9 o'clock. And then all of our seniors will be dismissed at 10 o'clock to go to the gym. And I'll get you lined up and get you in order as we're going to proceed into the sanctuary. And then we'll take group pictures there and all kinds of pictures in the gym. Uh, we, the service starts at 1030. So also this sa- Sunday uh, we're playing kickball if you want to go play. It's at the property uh, at our soccer fields from 2.30 to 4.30. Uh, and that gives you time to go home and eat with your families and chill, hang out, and then come back to the soccer fields. Your mom and dad come play too, uh, who, whoever in your immediate family. Okay, that's cool. So we got, we got plenty, plenty of uh, property to play on. So uh, I don't know what the weather is exactly, if it's any kind of uh, stormy or not, but I don't think it is. So we're just going to have some fun in the sun, okay? So that, just let me know if you plan on coming so I know how many teams to organize. Also, a couple of things is coming up that you'll need to sign up on that we'll start promoting by way of email is, uh, you know, camp is right around the corner. So for those going to camp, I know your mom and dads are signing up paperwork right now with Miss Ginger, having to get all that done because we've got to carry all that to camp and get it ready and organized. And then we want you to start preparing and prepping for camp as far as your clothes, uh, you know, your sleeping bag, pillow, all this kind of stuff. It's coming real soon to prep, and we don't want you to forget. We'll remind you about all that stuff. But we got some pool parties, in one in June and one in July that we typically have over the community pool. We'll tell you more about that. And then we're also going to have a day of carowinds at the end of the summer. Now, let me tell you about the Carowinds. If you, if you can go, we'd love for you to go. We typically have gone on a Saturday, but uh, it, it, there's two things, reasons why we're not going to do Saturday now. One, it's busy on Saturday, and it's, it's less busier during a weekday, a little less, which means I get more rides. Anybody with me? That's how I feel. So more rides. Secondly, it's cheaper it's still very costly to go to Carowinds. I've checked the prices, and they are, they are way up there. But we get a group rate, uh, 15 or more, and uh, it's still like nearly $50 to go with the group rate to go to Carowinds for one day. So it's very expensive, but on a Friday, that's the last day of, I know we don't want to say this, or want to mention this, but I have to mention this in order to understand the context. That's your last day of summer before you go back to school. That is August the 12th. Have you already gone to Citadel? Not yet. All right. So seniors, let me know. So August the 12th, you start back to school. Generally, the uh, Greenville County starts back on uh, the 15th. All right. So some of y'all are like, I already started back to school. I'm going to charter school. Skip. Just go ahead and skip it. Just come with us. All right. I mean, one day is not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt you. One day to care wins with us. Hanging out? All right. Uh, so think about that. Pray about that. You got through the end of June to decide and pay. So the cost to students is $30. So I'm offsetting the cost for our students. And then for all of our adult parents who want to go, the cost is just what we pay. And it's $45. That's the group rate. Okay. So um, think and pray about that. That's some things coming up. Also, I want to have a day. Sam, tell me if you'd be interested. You'd be out of school. We got a week between um, when you get out of school and somersault. Okay? So there's a week. Would one day that week be open to having our 4,130 uh, balloon fight? Would anybody be interested? Raise your hand if you're seriously interested. Water balloon fight. Amen. All right. So what we have to decide, and all right, so it'll be one day that week. I'll decide one day that week. Uh, we'll, we'll do some kind of lunch together. I'll, I'll work something out, and then I got something, but somebody's working out for some snow cones. So we, I mean, you're like, does this sound like kids camp? Yeah, yeah, I'm still a kid. I still like to play. That's what I'd like to do. Yes. Um, it's the first full week, so... Are you going 
How many, of, how many of our sixth graders going to children's camp? A few of y'all. Okay. I think y'all leave on Tuesday through Friday. So we, we'll see if we can do it on Monday if we do to include y'all. All right? I don't know. We'll see. I'll try to look that up. And then I've got to find a place where we're going to do it that's, that's, that's well. And I think we need to add some flour into this mixture. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I don't know. If, I don't know if any of our adults remember, we went to the Wofford's a few years ago, and uh, I think I got some of y'all seniors that was probably 7th seventh, seventh or 8th grade then, and uh, they, had ba- they had bags, flower bags, and water balloons, and they mix, and it sticks better. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it gets messy. It gets messy. But then, you know, it's summertime. It's what we do. Yes. We used to do, uh, it's like kickball. Yeah. Yes. You're sounding conniving. I like you. I like you. I like that mindset, Micah. Listen, so we're going to have some fun in some way with that, with that and it's, um, we'll talk soon because we want to set the date real soon. And I know it's impromptu, but uh, we just need some fun like that. But I need some help filling up the water balloons. Remember, I have 4,130, so it's going to take a little while, and I need some kiddie pools. You know what I'm talking about? Some little swimming pools? So we can put all these suckers in it, because you've got to have a little water. You don't want them to break. And so your mindset is to, to station it. We've got to have stations. So we've we got to dream it up big, and then you know it's probably going to take about an hour, and we'll be done, as far as that, that, that side of it, because we can throw them fast. All right? It just takes a while to prep it. All right, so those are the things coming up. So uh, I know you got family plans, but those are some plans for you to be a part of this summer. Let's look at the Bible here a few minutes, students. First of all, I want to commend you for coming on Wednesday nights. We've got two more Wednesday nights Bible study to finish up the book of Hebrews and then our, our celebration. And uh, I know the adults don't have anything going right now until uh, reconvening later this summer as well as the children. So I commend you for coming on Wednesday nights. And finishing out strong, we got two more. So I, I commend you. Um, so look, look at this text. This is the second half of chapter uh, 12. And we're going to pick up in verse 12. So Hebrews 12, 12. And we're going to read through the end of the chapter. And so here's the writer. We don't know exactly who the author is. It's, some say it's Apostle Paul, but it doesn't say I, Paul, am writing this. In most all his letters, he said that I, Paul, am writing this. I send this by way of Timothy or, or Silas uh, and these guys that were with him. But he, the writer doesn't say his name here. But we believe he's a, obviously he's a, he, he's a believer in Christ. And God used him to write uh, to the church, to the early uh, Jewish believers and the persecution they were about to face. And so he's very systematic right now up until this point, talking about Jesus being greater and being greater and being greater. And then he gets to that last half of chapter 12, uh, past in the chapter 11, 12. And he, this is what we call multiple areas of exhortations. So it's not one subject that covers the whole chapter. It's multiple challenges, encouragement, exhortations, warnings about living for Jesus. So there's multiple things here that talks about life. So what this is, this is just discipleship. He's discipling them to be more like Jesus. So there's a few of these things you'll go, okay, I get that. That few verses talk about this, that's different. The next verse is talking about this, it's different. And he's going to do that through the rest of this book. So the rest of chapter 12 as well as chapter 13. So next week we're going to cover chapter 13. It's uh, 25 verses. Or, uh, and we'll cover that next, uh, next Wednesday. So let's pick up in chapter tw- uh, 12, verse 12. We just got through talking about last week about persevering in our faith, running uh, the race, crossing the finish line with the Lord. Right? You don't quit. You don't throw in the towel. And remember, the goal is not to compete against each other as other believers. The goal is just to finish as a believer. So you're not my competitor uh, we're not in competing. We, the goal is to finish, is to cross the finish line with the Lord. To, we could be side. Some of us may be side by side. Some of us might be ahead of us because some of us are older in our faith 
And some will go home to be with Jesus before some of us. Um, doesn't have to be young or old. You could be young and go home to be with Jesus before I do. We've seen that. So you've got to be ready. So whenever that finish line uh, is God calls for us, we want to finish well. So he, gets, he talks about that. But he gets to chapter 12, verse 12, and he starts kind of uh, preaching different segments to the believer and so here's some things that he talks about. So look at verse, this verse 12 and 13 to start with. But let's pray. Lord, keep us focused tonight as we read the word. Lord, as we read the scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for our students and our parents and our volunteers here who love our students and care for them and just love you and uh, love to hear your word, Lord. We, we, we believe your word is to be heard, to be taught, and it challenges it. It reminds us of the things we should do in our faith. And Lord, I pray you'll, you'll do that tonight in Jesus' name. Look at verse 12. So he tells them after he talks about uh, yielding memory, he talks about discipline. There's discipline that we're all going to go through at life if we do wrong. When we walk with the Lord, we're going to consider to be disciplined by the Lord. He does discipline his children uh, different ways, but he does do that to keep us in line, to to bear us more fruit. Verse 11 talked about that. Then verse 12 he says, Therefore lift your droopy hands. This is an unusual uh, phrase. Droopy hands? What does that mean? Droopy hands and strengthen your weak knees. It, it sounds like a person that's discouraged. It sounds like a person that's just kind of down in their faith. Uh, somebody that maybe... Maybe they, they were disciplined because of a sin in their life. And some people are disciplined by sins in their life. And the Lord gives them a little spanking. And after that spanking, it don't always feel so good. Whatever the spanking is. The, it could be the Lord uses a, a pastor or your mom and dad or your Sunday school teacher or a friend to, to share with you a word. And it might be a word of rebuke. A gracious, a kind word of rebuke. But you're like, man, that kind of stings. But I know I get it. I, 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 I deserve that. I need to correct that. And then after that, you kind of have a sense of you need to regroup. You need to pray. What's, what is the action plan? And sometimes you kind of like, I don't, do I, do I want to start again? Y'all get a picture of this? Here's the picture I want to show you. The picture on the left, if you'll show that for us, Josh. Uh, if you follow me on uh, Instagram or Facebook, I've posted this before. And I saw this one day, and it struck a nerve in my heart. Droopy knees or droopy hands or bent knees, to me, depicts this guy on the left. Okay? All right? Are y'all are with me? He, he or she has been beat up spiritually. They've not walked in their faith the way they should. There's a lot of variables that go with that. Uh, this is a person without Jesus for sure. But this also can be a person with Jesus who is allowed a certain sin to creep into their life. That's what chapter 12, the last, the part before this verse, talks about spiritual discipline. The Lord takes care of those he, it is his. So, but with Jesus, do y'all see the difference in how he can make us? Enthusiastic. There's a different walk in people's life when it comes to when Jesus is, is real and pertinent in their life and they're walking with the Lord. They're not perfect. They're never going to be perfect. That's not what we're talking about. They're just trying to reach for, to be like Christ, trying to worship, trying to read the Word, trying to implement the Scriptures in their life. It makes a difference. So look at the verses. Uh, let me read verse 12 and 13 together. So he says, Therefore lift your droopy hands and strengthen your weak knees. Some translations say hands that hang down. Some translations say feeble knees. Uh, verse 13 says, And make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame, that is, you can tell these knees and, and legs are not strengthened spiritually and physically, may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. So you remember uh, scripture has to be applied to the scripture before and the scripture after. They have to go together. You can't just pull it out of thin air and go, yeah, that one verse by itself. So it goes back to spiritual discipline. The Lord disciplines this person who is his. That's us when we do wrong. And then uh, we got to come out of this slump. 
So I was talking to someone last night, I'll uh, uh, leave it nameless, but I went with another brother in Christ who went to minister to a family and uh, spent about an hour and a half uh, with them. And, uh, and uh, brother, they're right here on the left. They're weak knees, they're droopy, and, uh, and, and the question always is, well, how's your walk with Jesus? And it's not that good. I mean, we all have to be honest about that, right? We can say, well, I want it fixed. I want to be the guy on the right, but you can't do that without Jesus. I don't care. You can try all you want. You can think you can buy it. You can think you can just be around a bunch of people who's excited that it's going to rub off on you. But you have to have Jesus yourself. Your walk with Jesus, that's what makes you like the guy on the right. Without Jesus... You might have a day, one day, like the guy on the right, but it won't be consistent. Everybody with me? But with Jesus, you can have consistent walk like the guy on the right. But it's only with Jesus. So that means worship, consistent worship, corporate worship, personal worship, reading the Bible, prayer, special events we do together, listening to your mom and dad as they give devotionals, uh, Students, this is describing a discouraged Christian in this chapter. And he says in verse 13, he says, make your straight paths. That is, like, get on the right path. Walk the path that you're supposed to walk. The narrow path, the path that's righteous. Uh, and then he gives them some specific things to strive for to get on that path. And these are individual, I call individual exhortations, encouragement. Look at verse 14. First, he says, strive for peace with everyone. You know what that word strive for? It means reach for. Um, it means to set a right, uh, a relationship with all people. Does anybody ever had friends, family who just is hard to get along with? You know somebody like that? You tried every angle, every way, and you're like, I've tried to befriend them. I've tried to be hospitable to them. I've tried to talk to them. I've tried to greet them. Uh, uh, but they just, they just not happy people. Okay? They're cantankerous. They're kind of spirit about them that's just sour. And you're like, like I try, but like, like, you're hard to get along with some people. Some people just don't want to get along with people. They like themselves. It's like the grouch in Sesame Street. You know? They love being nasty. And I, that's not the Jesus people that we should be. But we're going to meet lost people like that. But the Bible just informed us that we as Jesus people should strive to live with peace with everyone. Strive. Reach for. Now, here's something I was reading, and this is where I, I asked the question big time. If I was asking the writer, and we're having a discipleship discussion about this, I'd say, okay, God told you to write in the Bible and to tell me as a believer, strive for peace with everyone, to which I would say, does that mean give up your convictions? No. So that means, you know, some people, they, they may not believe right, and it's hard to get along with them, and so that don't mean you have to give up your convictions about how to live for Jesus. You don't have to give that up in order to have peace with them, right? Well, you should, you should follow your convictions, biblical convictions. But then what it does mean is that we got to be courteous as much as we can, considerate and willingly uh, try to work with this person or persons uh, without quarreling, without fussing, without fighting. So it tells us that's the kind of friendships we, we got to try to seek. Does that mean you're going to be best friends and you're going to go out to lunch every other day? No. Hey, some people, I, I'm just going to be real with you. I don't like them. And they may say the same about me, but I'm just telling you, their spirit to be around them is just, it's just, they're a jerk. There's some people that's just jerks. Okay? Y'all with me? But it says, I've got to strive to live at peace with them. That is a command for a Christian. That's non-negotiable. You're like, even that person that's just so mean spirit. I think I've shared this before, but I'm going to say it again. My mom and dad, my dad especially, taught me just to get back and get even. That was my daddy's philosophy. 
Are y'all with me? So I remember living in this area in Fort Worth called Everman, Texas. Bad neighborhood. Every neighborhood was bad, but this one was kind of sem- very semi-bad. And uh, not like bad, bad, but it was bad. And next door was this guy who was into karate. He loved karate. He always, he always, psh, 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 you know, he's doing this all the time. He would come out, he had his outfit on, his black belt. He, was, he just was a jerk about it. He wasn't polite. He wasn't humble. He talked about who he beat up, how many belts he won, how many tournaments, trophies, all this kind of stuff. I think we were like 12, maybe, maybe 12. Okay, right? So he comes next door, and every time he comes next door, he wants to on me all the time. You know what I'm saying? Well, that hurts. Can I get a witness? Right? And, and so, like, he, he does it, and he does it like he meant to hurt me. And uh, I didn't like it. Now, my daddy's philosophy was get back. Right? I didn't know Jesus, so what I do, I do what my daddy teaches me. Right? He said, here's the deal. This is rocked on. This is rocked on. This rocked on. His mama saw this stuff. His mama was just as mean as he was. And she would come over and talk to my mom, and she would see this, but she wouldn't correct him. My mom would even talk about that. She's like, ah, that's just boys. I got a bruise the size of my fist on my face. That's, that's just boys. And he was a little bit bigger than me. And I didn't have the confidence back then as I do now. I mean, I may look like only 170 pounds, but I play mean like, I, like I'm, I'm bigger. There's a, there's a confidence now that I didn't have then that Jesus put in me now. Are you with me? No fear. So I thought, oh, well, what am I going to do, Dad? Well, here's Dad's, here's Dad's philosophy, okay? This ain't peace. This ain't striving for peace. Invite him over. Go into the garage. We had a garage back then. And uh, I got an axe handle behind the door. It has no axe on it. It's just the stick, the walking tall movie stick. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's been taped up. My daddy's used it for various things, and it's got been chipped on. And I thought, okay, what do I do with this thing? He said, I said, I'm just going to beat the mess up. No, he says, when he comes in there and he wants to play, your, play his karate game, well, then when he approaches you, you take that stick, and you just wail him one good time, and he ain't never going to mess with you again. So I was all fearful, and, you know, just kind of like getting geared up. So I was like, what's it? I, got, I, I was fed up with it. Fed up. Anybody ever been there? You're fed up with it. And so you're tired of this. You don't want to deal with, you don't want to have to deal with it this way, but this way it's going to be because it could fire. He, he could use a stick on me, you know what I'm saying? And still karate me some. So he goes in there. I just told him as he walked over to the side and he saw me, I picked up the stick. And I said, you're not going to karate me anymore. And because I was shaking and I was fearful, I should have just walked right up to him and just wailed him one time, just like my daddy said. Obey my dad, right? I throw the stick. And when I throw the stick, it hits him right in the knee. And it, it, it's like I, I heard it pop. And he goes down. And as he goes down, he's in, he's in torment. Okay, I'm just letting you know. I take off. His mama, by that time, has come over, want to know where he's at, talking to my mom. And she, my mom, knows what's going down. She knows my daddy has installed the get back plan in her son. And so I go out and uh, I run out to the backyard. We have a terrible backyard back then. We have stickers. Does anybody know what stickers are? It was full. The whole backyard was full of patches of stickers. So he starts coming out and through his, his karate leggings, I can tell it's bloody. And as he comes out, he's making his way. You know, he's dragging that leg after me, and we start rolling in the stickers. We are covered in the stickers, and at this time, this is when the moms see us, and they come out, and they try to break us up, and we are, we're going at it. And I come back in, and I was just, you know, I was like, man, I don't know what come over me, you know what I'm saying? I was just like, I mean, I'm just this little bitty kid that tired of people beating me up, and, uh, but I was like, yeah, yeah, Dad, I, I did what you said. You know, when he came home, my mom was like, she was mad at my dad. She was mad at me. But there was a part of her that was sort of excited because you know what? That kid never came back over to my house. Never. He didn't want no more axe handle on his knee. Are y'all with me? Now, students, today, that's not the way you problem-solve relationships. 
Is anybody with me? Is anybody with me? It is not the way to problem solve relationships. I would not advise you to do what I was advised to do. I will never forget it, though. But my Bible teaches me, what does it say? Let's go back to it. Strive for peace with, what does it say, that word? Everyone. That didn't just, now that means immediately in the household of God, with Christians, we should have this automatically. But we all should have, also have it for people who are lost, who don't know the Lord. And I, I, I struggle with that with some people out there who's lost and mean and just cantankers toward us sometimes. So I have to work on that myself. You do too, I do too. But I can say this, as far as in the church, it's non-negotiable. You cannot, you can't, you can't hate on each other. There's some people you're not going to get along with as, as, as good as others. There's still some people in our church, in our church, in churches, in the body of Christ, is still going to act like jerks to us. Sometimes you're like, man, they need more humility. Yeah, they do. They need to practice that area of their life. But we got to keep giving grace as much as we can without giving up convictions. So that, that's a big one. So look what the next thing he says, the writer says, look at verse 14. He says, strive for peace with everyone and then strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So verse 14, uh, it's a two-part. We should strive for peace, but he says we should strive for holiness. So in order to have peace, um, in order to have a, a lifestyle that's pursuing God, Holiness is supposed to be a part of it. We're reaching for godliness in our life. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, one of the Beatitudes, God, Christ himself says, blessed are those uh, who have a pure heart. They shall see God. That is your desire to have a pure heart, a, a heart that, that strives for holiness. That's what we text, what we watch, what we say, um, you know, how we treat people, uh, everything about us. And so look what it says. It says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So uh, I'll read some of the commentary I read about this today. It says, true sanctity, that is to be set apart. That's our DNA theme just a few weeks ago, a few years ago that is. It says the true sanctity of life will involve more than harmonious living with other people. That is peaceful living. It involves living in holiness before God. So listen to this phrase. When we became Jesus people, you, when you believed, positionally you were sanctified and given a position in Christ as a holy person. The Bible, you know what the Bible calls us? A saint. You say, why am I not a saint? I don't act like a saint. I don't think like a saint. You became a saint because Christ deemed you a saint because you believed in Jesus. You, gave a, you became a position of, of holiness in the Lord. So that means you've been sanctified enough to go to heaven. But that don't mean we're purely sanctified here on earth. We still got to work on our, our cleanliness, our, our being holy. So we're still practicing it. So here's what the, the commentary says. Even though we enjoy positional sanctification set apart, we're called a saint, we are still working on our conduct every day in order to keep in stride with that divine calling. So if you say, you mean the Bible says I'm a saint? Yeah. Do you live like one? No, I didn't today. Well, repent and pursue holiness. That's what the Bible just says. That's how, that's how you see God. You ever, you ever realize that when some people go, man, their, their intimacy with the Lord just seems sweet and real and rich and deep. You ever realize it could be they just living, they're living, they're living pure, as pure as you can. And the purer you live, the Bible says, you'll see God. You seem to experience him more. God does not reveal himself to nastiness. I'll, I'll explain this. Does anybody remember the story? Mount Sinai. Moses goes out walking, ministering to his sheep. He sees this burning bush up on the, this fire up on the mountain. He walks up there and he realizes, oh my goodness, there's a, there's a bush on fire, but it doesn't burn. It's not consumed. And as he approaches it, the voice of God, the voice of God comes out and says, 
that it's me, God. And that the place you're standing is holy ground. And he tells him, he commands him. Do y'all remember what he commands him? Take off your shoes. Take off your sandals. Because the place you're standing is holy ground. That mountain, we're going to we're fixing to read it. That mountain actually becomes a, a place called Mount Sinai. And there is boundaries on this mountain. It quakes. It, it has fire. It has smoldering smoke. Uh, it trembles. It quakes. And people were not to go near it to touch it. It was, it was like, there's holiness about God, and you just can't walk up in there. He allowed Moses to come, but he allowed Moses to come only because he was communicating God's word to him so he could tell it to the God's people. But only Moses could come in a certain way. See, God, God expects holiness because he's holy. And the more you strive for that, you'll see God. And I promise you, your relationship with Jesus will be sweeter, richer, pure. It will blossom. So the, the writer is teaching the believers here to strive for peace with everyone, reach for holiness. And then verse 15, he says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. So when I was reading this, what, what this means is, is that this person just got disciplined. Let's just say it goes back to chapter 12, early in chapter 12, where they got spiritual discipline. And there's correction. And this person was like the dude on the left, and he's getting corrected to be like the guy on the right. Well, one of those is, guess what? God shows him what to correct, but he doesn't or she doesn't correct it. And when they don't correct it and don't submit to God's plans, what happens is that, that fails to fall into the grace of God. See, you know one of the greatest gifts God gives us is called repentance. It's a gift. It's an awesome gift. That we actually get to repent and turn back to the Lord. You get a second chance, another chance, the next chance to be like the guy on the right. But here's, what, here's what's so sad. The enemy deceives us. When we get corrected, we don't like it. We stiff arm correction and we go right back to living ourselves, which really makes us droop and has no spiritual vib vibration whatsoever. I know so many people, I'll go, man, there's something wrong with their life. And it always boils down to the lack of Jesus. More Jesus just, just does a body good. Are y'all with me? Anybody here, is this a no-brainer? How many want to be the person on the right? I mean, it, I, it's a no-brainer for me. I don't think every day, every hour, every minute, I'm going to be like that guy on the right. But I think most of our lives and time of our lives can be like the guy on the right if we do strive to walk with Jesus. You can go, oh, I can tell there's a step in that person's walk. Like, you can tell there's a confidence about them when they talk about the Lord. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 15b. Look at this next phrase. He says, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. So, uh, here's what happens if you you can, you're going to have relationships, right? People, friends, family, uh, church relationships, relationships with everybody. I, I went into an Arby's yesterday. I hadn't been to one in a while. So I took the bus. You know what I'm starting to think right now? The buses need to be driven. You know why? We're about to, we're about to drive the buses a lot. And usually, you know, something happens to the bus. So let's start driving these suckers and make sure that we get all the kinks out. And if we got to fix anything, let's do it before we go to Somersault, right? Whew. We don't want that happening like we did last year, right? Lord forbid. Well, here's the deal. So I was just driving different places, trying to put some miles on it, listen to sounds, make sure it's good. And then I was like, hmm, it's 1230. I'm getting hungry. I'm over in Brushy Creek, and I, was, I saw the big army sign. And I walked in, and uh, this lady was the nicest lady it's rare to have in some restaurants, other than Chick-fil-A, I'm just being a little biased, to be nice to their customers. Are y'all with me? I'm sorry, it's, it's out there. There's just not some nice people working in some restaurants, and I know they got a hard job, but this lady was ultra nice. And she said, hey, how you doing? I mean, immediately, I was one of the only person walking in. There's a few people sitting down already, and I said, I'm doing fine. 
And uh, I wasn't feeling exactly perky at the moment yesterday. I ain't going to go into all the reasons why, but I was, I was kind of feeling like the guy on the left yesterday, heavily, heavily. And so I walked in, and when that lady started talking to me, she just changed my demeanor quickly. And as I started talking to her more, and she says, what's your name on that order? I said, John. Well, Mr. John, it will be right up. And she talked with polite, with respect, with encouragement. And then it wasn't I had just turned to get my drink, Dr. Pepper buys you. And as I turned back, she said, Mr. John, your order is ready. She brought it out to me and set it there by the drink machine and said, here's sauce number one. Here's radish sauce. I said, oh, no, that's the, I want that regular Arby sauce. I love Arby sauce on my curly fries. Is anybody with me on that one? And then, and then she showed me all the, all the things there and, and where the napkins in. She says, if you need anything else, you just say the word. That's rare. It's just rare. That lady needed a raise right then. Well, I sat down. I saw a lady over to the left. She was listening to something with some ear pods. Two guys from Greenville County was over talking. They was on their lunch break. And one guy was blasting his phone back in the back. And he looked like he was about 65. And he was listening to some rock and roll stuff. And I was like, man, I, I can't even listen to the music or what they're saying on here. But he, he, he didn't know that there's ear pods today. You know, you can put in your own stuff and can listen to your own stuff. But I was just listening and I was like, yeah, I'm, I, it changed my demeanor. And, and it went back to... Look what it says. No root of bitterness spring up and causes trouble. Look at this next phrase. So if you can be upset about something or upset at somebody about something, this next phrase shows you what you must do with it, this next picture that is. It's a little dark. When I saw this picture, I told Josh that it might be a little too dark. So this is a tractor uprooting uh, a tree root. Basically, he's getting it ready for his field. I'm sure it might have been some trees in this area where he is, he has cut it or it rotted, and uh, you can't you can't farm with roots. It's not going to work, right? Th those are notoriously problematic for a tractor. You can't disc with roots. So this is that verse. Look at that. I'm going to read that verse. Here it is up there. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. S help me, let's explain what the word uh, bitterness means. How can it cause us as Christians trouble? Bitterness. And it says it's the root of bitterness. Like, if this grows and infests in your life, it can spoil your growth in the Lord, it will haunt you, it will, you will not grow anymore until you deal with it. What's it mean? Bitterness. Mean Say again? Mean thoughts. mean thoughts. And elaborate on that. How did it start anyway? Because you just don't like them? Or did they do something towards you maybe? Okay, won't let it go. You know what I call this? This is the crock pot version of getting angry. Y'all know what crock pots are? Does anybody know what a crock pot is? Does anybody ever eat out of a crock pot? Okay. So, uh, you know, a crock pot takes all night typically, right? Or all day, several hours. It's not the fast, you know, stove top kind of, you know, go fast. It, it, it simmers. And then it starts boiling a little and then it keeps cooking, and it keeps cooking, just keeps cooking, and it keeps cooking, and it just keeps cooking, and it just keeps cooking, and you're like, man, this thing will go on forever. And if you let whatever it is between you and someone, and this is referring to other believers especially, but also to lost people in your relationship, if you let that build up and you just simmer on it and simmer on it, it becomes a root so big, and if you don't deal with it, it'll ruin you. It will ruin you. You know what this means? You have to practice forgiveness. You have to practice forgiveness in all relationships. You have to do this with your mom and dad. You have to do this with your siblings. You have to do this with people at school. You have to do that with people in church. And can I say, students, at church, it is, it is probably one of the biggest challenges that I have ever seen in church but in student ministry for students to get along. And you say, really? Is that, is that true about our student ministry? At times it can be. Drama 
we're all about some drama. That's, that's no good. But the fact is, sometimes we can, be so, we can allow things to be so divisive, the silly things, and it gets between us and it causes a root of bitterness. And basically we say, well, because of them and what they did to me that one time at camp or what they said about me on, on, on a piece of paper as I passed by one time, and, uh, and, I, and I didn't forgive it. I should have. And they asked for forgiveness, and I should have, but I didn't. I just can't let it go. And it just divides. Are y'all with me? Micah. Ten years later, you still remember it like it was yesterday, and it still bothers you when you see them. You just like, that's a bitterness. And, it, and if it gets in your soul, look at me, students, it will ruin relationships with adult people. And, and here's what I found out. Adult people don't reconcile as quickly as, as children. Children do better at this. They can go at it. And then the next five minutes, they're like, hey, what's up, best friends? You know what I'm saying? We're best friends. Y'all remember them days? Huh? Right? It don't, it, don't, it don't go as fast for students, but you all still can reconcile. But for adults, it's even worse. You're like, man, I thought, I, I thought, I, I thought we reconciled that like five years ago. You're like, it, it, ain't, it ain't fixed. What, what do we need to do to fix it? And it is ready for this. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. You have to forgive. So those are some principles that I think is a no-brainer. So I don't know what it is you have to do to uproot it. Whatever it is, if you have one of these in your life, but you got to get rid of it. You can't plow around a stump like that. You can't do it. Middle of a beautiful field of wheat, corn, peanuts, cotton, whatever it is. And they're like, what's that big bulge out there in the middle? Oh, that's a huge stump, man. It's been there for 20 years. You didn't dig it up? Ah, they won't deal with it. I just plowed around it. Took up three acres, wasted field, messed up this beautiful landscape of cotton, whatever it is you're planting, because you didn't want to deal with it. Are y'all with me? I'm just saying you have to deal with it. You can't sweep it under the rug. You have to deal with these things. Students, these are principles that this writers give to us. Then he goes in the next few minutes, and we've got to hurry. Look at verse 16. He says, he continues, that no one, and he's pretty blunt here, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like, and he names an Old Testament character. What's his name? Esau. Does anybody who, remember who Esau is? Who? Help me out, ladies over here. Esau, he had a twin named Jacob. Jacob and Esau, their daddy's name was who? Isaac. Isaac, Isaac had twin boys. These boys, guess who was born first? Esau. Then Jacob comes along, and the Bible says he was hanging on. Esau was kind of a manly kind of guy, loved to hunt. The Bible says he was all hairy. I don't know how hairy, but he must have been pretty hairy for the Bible says he was pretty hairy. He was red tinted. He had, he had beautiful red hair, but he loved to hunt. The Jacob, Jacob didn't like to hunt. Jacob liked to cook. Ain't nothing wrong with cooking. You know what I'm saying? Cook, but he liked to cook. So one day the Bible says uh, that these two guys, as they're growing up, that Esau, because he was born first, he was given a birthright, a special birthright by dad who was supposed to be the next spiritual leader of the family, and there was extra blessings that came with that just by nature of him being born first. That was just the way it rolled. Well, what happened is one day, because Esau was immoral, not just physically immoral, it tells us that, he was spiritually immoral. He literally did not want the things of God. The Bible says he didn't follow the things of God. He didn't listen to Dad. He didn't listen to God. He didn't do it. Jacob listened some, but he was a deceiver. But he listened to mom who was trying to coax him into this deceiving relationship with dad. And, uh, and there was just a mess in this family. Well, Jacob does get right with the Lord toward the end, but Esau never does. Never. So one day, here's what he is. Esau comes in and he says, uh, hey, man, what you got cooking? He's tired. He's hungry. And, and, it, and it tells us that... 
that he's cooking in Genesis chapter, oh, I guess around 25 or so in that area, he says, I'm cooking stew. He said, that smells good. He said, I want some of it. He says, I'll give you a bowl if you sell me your birthright. Ooh, that was a dig. That was a big dig. Kind of like, I, I know you're hungry. I know it smells good. And by the way, I'm a pretty good cook. And, and so I want what you got that I can't get because I'm the younger brother. But all you, all you, all you got to do to get this bowl of soup is to give me your birthright. Hand it over. Sign it off. And it says right then, in a moment of stupidity, he, he's so hungry. And he says, man, what's that? I am starving. And, and he says, give me that bowl. And he gave him the bowl. And he says, I want you to sign it. He signed off. And it literally, in that moment, he gave away everything. It showed his spiritual immaturity of the highest to have given such a blessing away. And the Bible says he forever regretted it. I'll read it. Look what it said. So it tells us, it says that, we are not to be sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. He is the horrible example who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. That is, his, He went to his dad and said, I messed up. I messed up. Can you give me something? And his dad says, no, you sold it. You don't want the things of God. He got, he got it and my favor goes to him. It says, for he found no chance to repent Though he saw it with tears, he literally went to his dad. He got on his knees and he begged. He said, give me, give me a chance. Give me something. And the Bible says he didn't ever want the spiritual blessings. You know what he wanted? You know what was part of the blessing? He wanted the piece of property to hunt on. Now, students, I'm going to say this. If you grow up in church and you're around a Bible your whole life and you're around you're around spiritual teaching like on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and you hear Pastor Aaron and everybody else preach the word here and worship and Josh and the band lead us in worship and hear all those wonderful songs about truth. And you walk away after graduation and you, and you don't apply all this to you. It, is it any different than Esau listening to the things of God and saying, give me a bowl of stew? It's like saying it's not that important. Students, uh, man, he gave up everything. And so the Bible tells us that's not the pattern in which we are to follow. It's not the pattern. Skip down to uh, just a couple of things and we're going to close. And I'm going to paraphrase for some of this for you for next week because of the time. He says uh, in verse, oh, verse 28. Look at verse 28. He says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So, there's going to be a comparison in this chapter here between what we call Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. So, Mount Sinai is what where God came and spoke to Moses and the children of Israel out in the desert. Mount Zion is the city of Jerusalem where Jesus came and died on the cross for us. God came and spoke to the people at Mount Sinai, but he came and spoke to the people through Jesus. And it compares Mount Sinai to, to what happens in Mount Zion. And Mount Zion is a place of grace. Mount Zion. Mount uh, Sinai was the place of the law. And then it gets to these comparisons. And then it talks about a kingdom, uh, about this kingdom that we've inherited in Christ, that it can't be shaken. You know what that means? It's a stable kingdom. I don't care if gas, Lord forbid, gets $10 a gallon. We're all in trouble. Our kingdom, the kingdom of God, is still just as sure as it was the day it started. It can't be shaken. Did y'all hear that? Our hope is sure. Even though we got high prices and all these challenges to face in this world, the kingdom of God, the eternal part, we are children of that kingdom. We're going to be with God forever. That's never can be shaken. Can I encourage you students with that tonight? 
you can rest peacefully tonight that God is in control. He has your eternity. He has you. He's going to take care of you and me. You have to believe that. And look what verse 28 says. He, he encouraged these believers. This writer says, be grateful and remember the kingdom can't be shaken. This kingdom is everlasting. And so if so, here's what it says, encourage us to do. Verse 28b, let us offer to God acceptable worship. Worship that, that is pure, that's holy, that's, that's reverent, uh, that's worshipful, that's in awe of God. And it says, for our God is a consuming fire. You know what that means? He, he, he soaks it up. He's, his holiness he soaks it up. I was listening to you all a while ago. I, I hope you do it with a pure heart. But you all do vocally sing. Uh, so as, because I know sometimes it depends on the song. And you may like more songs than others. I understand. But when Lily was singing us the song at the end about the church and the body and, and the Holy Spirit. You, you can hear the volume go up. In here. And if you have a pure heart, even if you like me and you, we don't know how to actually sing vocally well like the band folks and whoever else sings, I'm still a worshiper. And you can't deny that. And if it's in a pure heart, the Bible says, I, I come with an acceptable worship, a, a desire to give glory to God with my lips, with my heart. And it says God consumes it. He takes it in. I'm going to preach this Sunday for graduation. I'm going to preach about what it is to be the aroma of Christ. What, what, what is it to be like Christ, to be a sweet-smelling offering to God with our lives? We're going to talk about that Sunday morning. Pray with me, students. Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for just teaching of your word. I pray our students listen. I pray they listen with intent to obey. And uh, Lord, I pray that the scriptures just seep into their lives and their hearts and that they walk away and go, hey, I remember that verse. I remember that scripture. I remember that picture about that verse. And uh, I pray that they'll just add to their faith and grow more to be like Jesus because of it. Thank you for the band and always, uh, and Josh and the band for always leading us in worship. We, we want to give you glory, Lord, with our voices, whether we're on stage or in the chair. It doesn't matter. We're all on equal ground. We are here to worship you. And so I just praise you, Lord, for this night that we can gather. Lord, we give you all the glory. Just every, everybody please stand and let's, uh, let's give honor and glory to our God.
all. We'll see you next week. Have a great week.